Welcome to Tiny Epics. I'm excited to bring you part two of my Minoan Civilization interview with prominent Minoan scholar and author Nano Marinatos. In my previous interview with her, she introduced us to the fascinating and highly sophisticated world of the Minoans, who dominated the Aegean Sea nearly 4,000 years ago. We learned about archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans, who famously unearthed the massive maze-like palace known as Knossos, which was mythologized by the later Greeks as the home of the Minotaur. She also talked about Evans' connection to her father, Spiridon, the archaeologist who excavated the Minoan settlement of Akrotiri Thera, an absolutely incredible site that had been buried under volcanic ash for well over three and a half millennia. If you haven't already seen the first interview, I recommend checking that one out first before diving into this one. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump back into the ancient world of the second millennium BC, starting with a discussion about Minoan religion. And now that we bring up the religion, I, I'm really curious to get into this because that's one aspect of ancient cultures I find so fascinating. Who did they worship? What did they worship? And, and why? And with the Minoans, uh, especially in your expertise, your, your field of expertise, studying religion, what are your thoughts about uh, the Minoan religion and, and how they worshipped? Yeah, I will be very happily uh, sharing my thoughts with you. But first, I want to say a few things about my method, because people can say our listeners, if they watch this video, they will say, how does she know? And anything we say about a culture which has left texts, but we can't read them, uh, anything is going to be speculative. But I don't think so. I think there, there is a record about Minoan religion, and it's images. We have lots of images, lots of them. So what I have been doing in my work, following Evans's approach, actually, is to match those images, put them in categories, see where they overlap, see what stands out, see what is deviant, and then recreate a kind of language, or let's call it a system of thought, a system of visual thought. Um, and you can say quite a lot of things after that. So I have come to the conclusion that Evans was right. There is a major female goddess. And this is not just a theory out of, out of the blue. It's a theory based on the fact that whenever you have a seated figure, and a seated figure is a queen, right? It's not any figure. Whenever you have a seated figure, it's a female, never a male, never. Not once in my non-art do we have seated males. Wow. How, why is she a goddess? Because she's flanked by eagles. You'll be able to show images and, uh, and uh, show testimony to that. Other times she has marvelous griffins next to her. She's in a kind of otherworldly landscape uh, and things that are supernatural and they feed the imagination. But she does look like Virgin Mary, as it were, except that she has bare breasts. But that's necessary to show that she's the source of, of life, all life. And so she's divine. This is not a, a human person. Um, secondly, she often has a god next to her who looks very strong. He's um, very athletic, but he's smaller than her. And so that means that I don't think he's subordinate in the sense that he's not strong, but he's younger. And so I'm convinced that this is a mother-son relationship and not an erotic relationship. Hmm. Because they never touch, they never go like this, you know, kisses or nothing or holding hands, or it's always very hierarchical. When I saw these images that you had just described, I immediately wanted to think this was a matriarch society, that this was the worship of women, and was very curious if the Minoans were such a culture of matriarchal power structure. Well, feminization of religion doesn't mean matriarchy at all. Um, think of Christianity where Virgin Mary is in some countries like Italy, Spain, South America, Virgin Mary is more important than Jesus, one would say. But it's not a matriarchal culture. 
And another example I can have is Egypt. Um, when the very male pharaoh Akhenaton, the, who is often called the heretic king because he introduced monotheism, he didn't feminize the god because the god was abstract. The god was just the sun disk, that's all, no gender. But he was the representative of this god and he feminized himself and made himself look almost androgynous so to show that a god is both genders together. So I think in this duality, mother and son, we have something similar in my non Crete. The mother goddess and her powerful athletic warrior type son. And would this goddess have had a human representative within Minoan society? Yes, the, the queen and the queen mother, I would think. And why do I say that? Because in Hittite, in Hittite um, culture, in Egyptian culture, the highest offices, the highest positions were reserved for the queen and the queen mother who acted as high priestesses of the chief female goddess. And do you know about, um, can, is there a way to reconstruct some of the rituals that took place in Minoan culture? Yes, um, I think that the king and the queen would head uh, processions. Uh, they would perhaps leave the palace of Knossos and maybe walk towards the sacred mountain, which is called the mountain Yuktas. It's visible from the palace. And up on top, there was a shrine. So I can envisage a procession with many people following, but the king and the queen are are heading the procession. Uh, other rituals would have been offering sacrifices, prayers in public, and then distributing food to the people, bread and um, you know meat. So when we say sacrifice, sometimes it's bloody with anim animal meat, very common. And sometimes it's just breads and cakes and raisins and things like that. But in all these cultures, we have parallels. And I, that's what I find really, what I found so interesting about reading your book, uh, Minoan Kingship and the Solar Goddess, is that you're able, from looking at what was happening around Crete, you're able to then interpret the belief system because it wasn't just happening in one place, but there were similar belief structures in place, not only in Egypt, but then also in um, the Levant areas like this. The Levant and the Hittite, the, in Anatolia, the Hittite Empire. That's exactly right. And I'm glad you brought this up because the principle behind my book on the Solon Goddess is that let's look at the neighbors of Crete. You see, what scholars usually do is they project Greek religion onto the past, assuming that there's complete continuity over 3,000 years and that the religion of the Minoans somehow survived into the time of Pericles. <laughs> it's too long a time and too many changes. Whereas what I try to do is to look at the contemporary world with which Crete, of course, had contacts for trade and so on. And so I think they had many beliefs in common, including worship of the sun. I'm absolutely convinced about that. And they had common symbols, like the so-called horns of consecration, which are exactly the same as the twin mountains of the Egyptians. So I don't think they are horns, I think they are mountains. And in between them, you see the sunrise, which is so important. The rise of the sun every day. It's the beginning of a new cycle of new life. And so this is in contrast to the Greek mythology, the Greek religion, because I also know a bit about Greek mythology, and they do have sun deities. Helios, I believe, is one, and Apollo is sometimes associated with the sun, but there's not a main solar deity. There's not a worship of the sun. Is that, is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And in fact, there's so many differences between Greek religion and Minoan religion, and that's what makes me resist the continuity theory. So first, you mentioned yourself, number one, where is the mother goddess in, in, a Greek, in the Greek pantheon? You have Zeus. Okay, he has a mother, but she's very secondary uh, person, secondary citizen. <laughs> Rhea hardly gets any worship. So there is abolition of the uh, mother goddess. Number two, where is the solar religion? As you say, there is a sun god, but he's totally, he doesn't receive worship. No Greek worship the sun. 
Um, and these are two major differences. And three, the symbols of my non-religion are gone. You don't have the twin mountain or the double axe. They don't exist in a Greek cult. This is one of the most iconic symbols from the Minoan culture. Could you explain a little bit more about what the double axe symbol means and why they used it so often? So my theory is that the double axe is an allomorph, allomorph meaning a, a, a different form uh, for the sun. Because the double axe has a duality about it, just like you know these spectacles have two sides to them and they're equal. So does a double axe. There is a left and a right and they're exactly equal. And the sun has this duality about it, night and day, light, darkness, when, and so on. Um, so how I came to the conclusion that the double axe signifies the sun, this is very complex. I can't explain it here. It's all in my book. Uh, I have deciphered this by association. Uh, for example, a double axe is shown among plants and the plants are growing and so is the double axe. So to me, this is a sign that it's a regenerative symbol and many others, or the, it's in the bottom of the sea. What is the double axe doing in the bottom of the sea? Um, together with fish. It's reviving the fish. So through this series of complex syllogism and images, I have arrived, I'm giving you the digested version that it represents the sun. And that brings Minoan Crete close to Egypt again, because Egypt is the, the, the birthplace of solar religion. And one more thing, Lance, before we leave this topic, there is no culture in the 15th century before the common era, that is not a solar worship culture. Oh, not wow. one that I know of. Mm. All of them had solar worship. It seems quite a natural thing to worship, right? Because you have a natural attraction to the sun. We, we often say, I miss the sun, or when it's cloudy, you get in a, in a negative mood. And I think it's also been shown that cultures that had a lot of sun were different, let's say, the northern cultures who live a lot of the time without access to sunlight or strong sunlight. And the whole of nature craves the sun. It's very obvious if you think about it. Absolutely. And so ultimately, even though there was this solar goddess, as you call her, she's sort of always holding or wielding these double axes, um, that it wasn't maybe necessarily the goddess wasn't the end point. It was beyond the goddess. She was sort of maybe the embodiment of the sun. But then beyond her, they would see it in a more perhaps universal understanding, a non-gender, non-binary. Yes, in a more abstract way. So on the one hand, there is a, an anthropomorphic deity. But on the other hand, beyond that, there are abstractions like spirals and things that obviously have a religious significance, but they express the abstraction of the goddess. Uh, that, for me, is very satisfying to think about a deity as something abstract that doesn't have a gender, that doesn't have a name, because it, it seems more intuitive. It seems more like um, if we're this small species on this small planet, there's clearly vast amounts of space and vast amounts of matter that exist far beyond our understanding. And it seems to be quite logical to pick the biggest thing, the brightest thing that you have in your particular world to, to make as a focal point. Exactly, exactly, exactly right. That's how I would put it too. And I think that's maybe what I really um, respond to about the Minoan culture is this love of sunlight. If you were an average Minoan living, let's say, in 1600 BC, could you have had quite a nice life in, on Crete? I think almost certainly yes, because look at their houses um, and their high standard of living. Of course, you would have had a nice life. And there was plenty to eat. You know, we should never forget that famine is always a plague. Even for a rich place like Egypt, if it doesn't rain enough, if the Nile doesn't flood, there will be a crop disaster. People have to be fed. But in Crete, there's so much land. And if something doesn't work on this part of the island, there will be rain on the other part of the island, or you can go up in the mountains. So the abundance of nature gives you comfort. What we can sense is that they were kind of egalitarian. Um, 
there is no evidence of a prison-like society and of patrolling. Um, the houses are free. They are not. They don't have little towers around them. And this leads me into a question I wanted to ask you. Um, I first asked if the Minoans were a matriarchal society, and you have clarified that for me. Um, the second question I had is. Were they this flower picking, peace loving? This is kind of how, from looking at the frescoes, some of them, I've interpreted the culture, but were they uh, completely peaceful and, and non warlike? You don't run an empire by flowers. <laughs> you have to use some force. You can try. And you know, persuasion is a very complex thing. Uh, we go through this, all cultures do, with the police. You know, how do you use the police? And nobody, even in our days, wants a brutal police, but you have to have some police <laughs> because that persuades people to be orderly. Um, and so that's what the Minoans did. They patrolled the Aegean. They had dominance over the Aegean. But without power, you cannot oblige the others to collaborate with you. So they used soft power and naval power. Now, how do we know that? Because we have some frescoes. And again, my father's excavation at Akrotiri has yielded frescoes with Minoans, people dressed with Minoan helmets and Minoan symbols, sitting in those boats. And they're, without a question, warriors. Why? Because they have helmets and they have spears. So this is a warrior fleet. It may be doing business also, but there are warriors sitting in there, just in case. I just wanted to say a thank you for being here and sharing your knowledge about the Minoan religion with us. I was delighted. I was delighted to share any time. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that wraps up the second part of my interview I certainly feel like I've learned a lot more about Minoan religion and society, and I hope all of you viewers out there have as well. In part three, we'll take a closer look at the Minoan settlement of Akrotiri and the phenomenal frescoes that Nano's father Spiridon discovered there starting in the 1960s. Let me know what you thought of this interview by commenting below, and take the time to give it a thumbs up if you liked it. And if you loved it, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. See you next time, and as always, thank you so much for watching.